We are welcoming you onto the roast room with a huge round of applause, Dr. Kavita. <laughs> it just doesn't stop for you, see? I have to, uh, you know, state like a, put a disclaimer at the outset that my topic is uh, pediatric cataract, and I am not a pediatric ophthalmologist. In my hospital, we don't really have any department as such. We have part timers who come and go. So I do a few cases, in fact, but I don't claim to be any expert on that. Whatever is my limited knowledge, I will uh, share about that. So I think uh, when we are doing pediatric cataract surgery, there are. Uh, can I have the slides moving, please? Not so moving. Yeah. So the few questions to answer are that is surgery needed or not uh, needed? Is an intraocular lens needs uh, to be put or not? Surgical technique, what technique we are choosing? The intraocular power calculation, and of course, not to forget that uh, that the job does not stop with surgery, but post-operative uh, management. So uh, to operate or not operate, I think if the cataract is like this, where it is not in the central visual axis, or it's not enough to cause any visual problems, or if it's a blue dot cataract where we know that you know it doesn't really impact the vision too much, so then uh, we do not uh, we we can observe this uh, child and look at the vision. Now, what are the indications uh, for early surgery? Like in which are the cases that you are going to operate? Obviously, if there is a total cataract if it's a unilateral cataract, if it's an asymmetrical cataract, because that's also going to cause uh, amblyopia, and if you're seeing secondary effects like strabismus, nystagmus, or if it's an older child, if you can see the vision, if the vision is less than six by 18, and he's having concomitant strabismus, nystagmus, I think these would be indications for early uh, surgery. Now, put an in, putting an intraocular lens or not, uh, like I mentioned, most of the pati patients I've done have been about 24 months. Uh, if the child is lesser than uh, 24 months, uh, you know, there is a, going to be a lot of myopic shift and a refractive, uh, you know, error calculation errors. So if you're going to put it in an infant, I think uh, for certain uh, prerequisites which need to be fulfilled, the corneal diameter needs to be more than 10 millimeters, action length needs to be more than 16 millimeters, normal intraocular pressure and an absent uh, angle anomalies. When you're calculating the IOL power, uh, the rule of seven for above two years, age plus target hyperopia is seven. So if you are going to uh, operate, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, like if you're going to, if it's a, if it's a child is a two year old, then you're going to aim for five diopters of uh, target hyperopia. Now again, in infants, like I said, I don't have any first hand knowledge, but this is how uh, literature reports that if it's uh, lesser than, uh, you know, six, around less than six months, then around three to seven diopters. So as you can see, it's very vague, like, you know, the recommendations, it's around six to eight diopters is what the infant aphakia study shows. Now surgical techniques, two techniques, either lens aspiration with primary posterior capsular rexes with anterior vitrectomy. The PCC and anterior vitrectomy is mandatory in the younger kids who are not going to be able, you're not going to be able to do an ND YAG because I think the PCO rates, as we know, is almost 100%. Or you can, in the younger kids, or especially congenital, like rubella cataracts, where the cataracts very friable, where you're going, and in infants, you may need to do a lensectomy with an anterior vitrectomy approach. So this is my, uh, I'll just show a video. So this uh, anterior uh, capsular rexis, I think it is very different from doing in an adult. Once you make the initial nick, uh, the pediatric uh, rexis forceps really helps. The, you have to grip and re-grip, and after using a nice uh, you know, viscoelastic in the anterior chamber, keep re-gripping. In if you see towards the end of this video that in spite of you know, doing that, there is, a, there is a point where it is actually trying to run to, through the periphery, but uh, it's important to stay cool and refill the eye if uh, possible, and uh, go ahead and complete your uh, rexes. So this is the point where it's now gonna try and start, you know, running out a little bit, and, uh, but you can go ahead and salvage the situation. So this is a most important uh, step here. You can see it's running out a little bit and you can keep pulling towards the center and you know salvage the situation so uh, next uh, would be uh, it's very the next is pretty much just you go ahead and remove your viscoelastic and do a lens aspiration there is not uh, much to that uh, after your lens aspiration is done because not much i'll just move to the next video what is important is your posterior 
what's important is your posterior capsular axis here also the initial neck uh, you make it with your uh, you know 26 uh, gauge needle and then use your uh, uh, you know the axis forceps and go ahead and um, uh, complete your posterior uh, capsular axis i also do an anterior vitrectomy here you make that neck can we forward the video in any way yeah, so you go uh, use an anterior vitrectomy, or vitrectomy and also do a limited anterior vitrectomy and then you can place the IOL either in the bag or three piece IOL, whichever IOL. Here I'm going to place a single piece IOL. You can keep it uh, small and limited, don't have to ma like make it really large so that it's easier to do your in the bag, uh, you know, placement. Again, sa similar, uh, you know, steps uh, just like your anterior, you go back, grip, regrip and complete your uh, Rexes. I think I'll move forward in interest of uh, time. Uh, so uh, what happens once the surgery is over, and at the end of surgery, always take a suture, you know, in these cases. Obviously, if it's an infant, you're going to give the glasses. Make sure you're giving glasses along with, like, bifocals and amblyopia management in IOP monitoring is very, very important. Uh, because I'm a cornea surgeon, I have to talk about this. So uh, these are the cases, pediatric cataracts are the cases where you may, uh, you know, aim at doing a primary or an early cataract surgery. Otherwise, typically, we wait for three months after suture removal. So this was a patient where it was a child and we had, this was how they came with a ruptured anterior capsule and we had took the other eye intraocular calculations and we went ahead with doing a primary intraocular lens implantation because we didn't want to subject the child to another, uh, you know, anesthesia and uh, obviously the capsule was ruptured. This is another patient with a very extensive uh, corneal tear where you can see the sutures are in and you know we have not removed the sutures and uh, you know rupt the ruptured anterior capsule where we have I've done the lens aspiration and I'm going to now place the intraocular lens and this is uh, uh, I used a three piece IOL because obviously there is no rexis. This is how the patient looked at the end of removing sutures and the patient gained a six by six vision. So thank you so much. But I tell you what, uh, if you make presentations like that and you put forward a disclaimer that you're not a pediatric ophthalmologist, you're going to take, turn a lot of pediatric ophthalmologists jealous of you the next time they would walk into the podium to speak on something. <laughs> Just one question uh, before I invite the uh, panel or the audience for uh, shooting questions at you. Uh, since you mentioned that you would be waiting for some time if there's a corneal tear that's too existent, would you always do that or would you restrict yourself to cases where the anterior lens capsule is not ruptured along with the cornea? So if the anterior lens capsule is not ruptured, if we are not going to do any retinal you know, intervention, if there's no hemorrhage, RD and all of that, and if it's an adult, then I would definitely wait, uh, unless it's a getting into and causing you know, problems with the chamber. In an adult, for sure, I would wait for three months, get the sutures out, stabilize the corneal topography, and then go ahead with doing an intraocular lens placement. But if the uh, uh, capsule is ruptured in an adult, then at the same time, I would probably just do a lens aspiration, but not an IOL implantation. But because these were you know, kids, we didn't want to subject them to again another, and just use the other eye for you know, doing the IOL placement. So you would do it in the primary setting itself? I did it in these two cases, and, yes, and yes. Right, and when you plan it after suture removal, if you find that the opacity, uh, the scar that's resultant of the corneal tear is bisecting the pupillary area. Which was they did, like you saw in that case. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just asking you if it's bisecting the pupillary area, so that there's very little area of the visual axis left clear, would you consider an aridectomy after even putting in the IOL just to increase the window through which the light transmission would take place? Would you, would you consider that? That's a good suggestion, though I haven't really done that. This child, uh, you know, I did uh, refractive, I mean, after, after I did refraction, she did, initially she was six by 12, but over a period of one year, with a good amblyopia management, she did come to six by six. But I think your point is very valid. If the scar you feel is denser, then yes, that would be a great suggestion to, you know, implement. Any other questions for them? Anything from the audience? Any points? No, I get a few points for going first also. Absolutely. <laughs> you, you, you deserve another round of applause for that. Thank you so Kalila. much. Thank, Thank you so much Thank for you. accepting the